In this video, uh, we will talk about Lebona chip and microfluidics in detail, which uh, means generally introducing these two uh, subjects, relevance to the modern industry, different application areas, microfluidics and its own applications, uh, comparison to traditional instrumentation, the limitations of microfluidics and future perspective. This slide you have already seen uh, in, in the, the short introduction, so I will not uh, spend much time here. Just uh, want to emphasize that lab on a chip means microscale laboratory automation. And microfluidics is the technology with which you can realize uh, liquid handling in this size regime and in this uh, uh, compact integrated device format. Uh, so the relevance to the industry and then where uh, Lebona chip could really shine is uh, in Pharma 4.0, which is, uh, you can think about it as a branch to industry 4.0 um, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, at the moment, the pharma industry is uh, doing synthesis of drugs in, uh, in huge quantities in, in batch chemistry. So you have large volumes, but uh, low unit costs. Problem is, if you have an error in your process, which you usually don't, that's what quality uh, management is for. But if you have an error, then the outcome is much worse than if you work with lower volumes. So what Lab on the Chip can do here is uh, improve process control because you work with smaller volumes and uh, then you can more closely monitor and adapt uh, process parameters. So in case of an error, uh, the loss will be reduced. Uh, so this is one kind of uh, application where Lab on a Chip can shine. Uh, other ones are related to, uh, to diagnostics and analytical applications, but uh, there is also uh, high throughput drug screening, which is directly connected to what I just uh, spoke about. So Lab on a Chip can contribute uh, greatly to uh, high throughput screening because you can uh, push through this Lab on a Chip type device uh, a great amount of, uh, of liquid in a unit time, and you can parallelize since these are small and by themselves uh, cheaper than uh, traditional instrumentation. You can have multiple running in parallel and uh, that will increase your throughput uh, quite greatly. But the, the direct sensor and actuator integration into this system is what uh, results in, in a greater degree of process control. In the previous uh, slideshow, uh, where I talked about biomems, and in the short uh, introduction, I also mentioned that you can uh, integrate different laboratory functions into Lab on a Chip type devices. So this is not the only field where it can be applied, it can also be applied to uh, uh, make integrated uh, point of care diagnostics. But I would like to bring this to you, to your attention, as a, a possible immediate application in the industry. Uh, other application areas are in proteomics, analysis of proteins in just regular chemistry to implement uh, workflows in a compact integrated format in molecular biology, in, uh, for instance, uh, DNA uh, detection, and then in cell biology uh, is, for instance, uh, cell culturing. So if we compare uh, with the more traditional technology, and by traditional I don't mean um, manual uh, labor, uh, a fair comparison would be to uh, liquid handling robots. So let's uh, have that as the focus. Uh, microfluidics works with low liquid volumes, which means uh, lower uh, reagent costs and uh, less waste. Uh, liquid handling robots have uh, a high throughput. Uh, they also work with low liquid volumes, but uh, typically the range would be microliters to milliliters. And uh, the precision is good with air displacement pipettes. However, in the sub-microliter range, the precision is even better with microfluidics. 
So you have excellent volume control uh, in microfluidic applications. Um, and, and you have best, better uh, process control in uh, chemistry because you have a fast response because of the low uh, unit volumes that go through uh, your systems in, uh, in a certain time. And therefore, you have better thermal uh, control on reactions and so on. Uh, whereas um, microfluidics are compact, but application-specific uh, liquid handling robots are modular and customizable. So that would be your, uh, your primary difference. However, you can have uh, various uh, microfluidic chips for various purposes and you can mix them and, uh, and match them in the way you would like. The thing is, with uh, massive parallelization, the, the unit cost is still low and in mass production, you can still end up with a cheaper system in uh, microfluidics than uh, you would end up with with a liquid handling robot. So, main difference here would be that you have single specific applications with low volumes um, where the device cost is low, whereas here you have modularity, customizability, uh, flexibility of uh, the application. So, general purpose instrument, application specific instrument, and this one is good for disposable applications and fast uh, tests, so rapid testing. And here I would also like to emphasize the significant initial cost uh, to the liquid handling robots that I mentioned already in the previous slideshow. Uh, the limitations. There is this, which is always a problem. Ever since I first joined this field uh, some 12 years ago, there was always the promise that in five years, we would break the barrier and we would enter the market and there would be so many billions of dollars uh, earned. And we're still not there 12 years later. And the same thing can be said uh, 20 years ago was uh, the same idea. We still haven't broken that barrier. So there are applications. There are certainly 10 times more companies than there were uh, a decade ago. But the problems are the same. The regulatory environment is difficult to work with because these microfluidic devices, if you go in diagnostics, then you are in the IVD uh, category and then all the rules apply to you same way. So in vitro diagnostics. Everywhere else also you need to go through the same certification as, uh, as other uh, laboratory grade or medical grade uh, instrumentation. There are still technical issues that need to be overcome. And if we talk about uh, point of care devices, which are personally my favorite and, and my interest, then we also have unclear financing in uh, national healthcare schemes. So you can, you can uh, notice that I talk about a lot of different applications, uh, pharmaceutical industry being one, uh, bioanalytical being the other, and diagnostic being the third. Um, these are all uh, possible avenues of application. And uh, in one way or another, they will be part of this course. But uh, when I say unclear financing, then I talk about uh, analytical and diagnostic devices. Uh, bad signal to noise ratio. Because of the small sizes, whatever sensors you implement, and typically electrochemical sensors, will have a very bad uh, signal to noise ratio. Because of the small size and the high sensitivity, they pick up a lot of noise. Uh, you typically need external instrumentation. So even though this is a compact and integrated system that combines uh, several laboratory functions on a single chip, you still have the problem that uh, you need to have a connection to a pump, for instance, or valves, or um, means of uh, temperature control, or the instrument control. So it is maybe compact, may be minimally instrumented, but it is still instrumented nevertheless. There are very few devices that are completely instrument-free in lab on a chip. And by instrumentation, I mean electronic instrumentation. Uh, manufacturing is complex. It requires expensive instruments and highly specialized personnel. And these are both uh, drivers of cost uh, the same way. And uh, there are also side effects of uh, scaling down. 
uh, just like in any uh, other kind of miniaturization effort, that uh, you can have unforeseen surface or chemical interactions, uh, for instance, capillary forces, wall adhesion, uh, bubbles forming or clogging of the channels. We will talk about these uh, in the theoretical module. And uh, this one here is a close-up of uh, a simple microfluidic mixer. It is a glass polymer chip, polymer being uh, PDMS, polydimethylsiloxane, uh, short and usually PDMS. And this is a so-called snake mixer. We have one input, another input, and they mix through this uh, snaking channel. And I will explain in the theoretical module why you need to do it like this and why it only works like this, but let it be uh, for now as it is. So you see the mixing of uh, these two reagents in this uh, snaking channel. So let's talk about uh, microfluidics and let's uh, place it on a size scale. And uh, once again, microfluidics works on the micro and nano scales um, and it studies uh, the science of uh, fluidic behaviors in the micro and nano scale, but also it works with uh, simulation fabrication of uh, fluidic devices for the transport, delivery and handling of fluidics on the order of microliters or sub-microliter volumes. So where are we on this uh, scale from uh, molecular to macroscopic uh, size scale? We are, uh, in terms of volume, we are around uh, here, so milliliter down to picoliters. And uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, dimensions, we go from millimeter to micrometer. There is also a branch of uh, nanofluidics, which go down to uh, the nanometer scale, but uh, that will not be part of this course. We deal with microfluidics here. And um, if we look at the relation between the sample volume and the analyte concentration, analyte being the target that you want to detect uh, some kind of molecule or bacteria or whatever you think about. So how much volume do you need to detect a certain amount of uh, analyte? Um, so analyte concentration is uh, determined by mole per cubic meter. So uh, the number of molecules inside uh, a specific volume. And then this is the sample volume that you need to have so many. This is just a, a qualitative relationship that uh, you can estimate what you need to detect certain things. And uh, uh, this is a scale of the concentration of uh, the different targets in uh, human blood and other samples. So we have here uh, chemicals and uh, hormones, and then cells and DNA are mostly uh, uh, DNA, which we can use to detect uh, biological uh, processes or physiological or, or pathogenic processes. So this here is, uh, is a quite nice uh, graph, which uh, just shows you the required analyte concentration or sample volume uh, uh, ratio for uh, uh, clinical chemistry assays, immune assays, and DNA probe assays. Uh, so to detect uh, different chemicals, to detect uh, pathogens like bacteria, harmful bacteria, or to detect uh, the DNA of living organisms. And um, here's where, like, uh, in this uh, range of uh, the analyte concentration to sample volume ratio, is where you have less than one molecule per sample. And then above this dividing line is where we can really exist with our uh, detection assays. And we talk about uh, copies per milliliter here. The sample volume is in liters. 
So um, this one here is your uh, typical, uh, again, typical PDMS glass microfluidic device. Uh, I use this as an example to continuous flow microfluidics, which uh, means uh, a constant, regular, continued flow of liquid inside your microchannel. It enables to manipulate a continuous flow of liquid that goes through this microchannel, in this case the mixer. You need a pump to move the liquid, so you either introduce an external pressure uh, or a flow rate, uh, or, or you uh, induce a flow by uh, pressure or flow rate control, or you can have uh, an integrated mechanical micropump, which can be as simple as uh, just a button that you need to push which uh, squeezes your volume out. But essentially, that is also a pressure generator if you just have a, a button that you push to squeeze the liquid forward. Applications are in bioanalysis, chemistry, and uh, energy and environmental fields. Now, uh, there's another branch of microfluidics which uh, you will have two lectures on. It's uh, droplet microfluidics. You can also think about it as discrete microfluidics, where instead of having a continuous uh, stream of liquid, you work with droplets or emulsions. So these are uh, typically multi-phase uh, emulsions of uh, phases that don't mix. For instance, oil and water. Uh, this would be your typical mixture that you encounter in everyday uh, droplet microfluidics. And you have here uh, an example of that. So this is a droplet uh, generator chip. You have uh, the junction for forming the droplets. And then oil comes through these channels. And then water comes uh, through this channel, or the center stream. And inside that center stream, you can encapsulate cells into these uh, droplets of uh, water within oil. Uh, these cells here on this image are shown like that. So again, hydrodynamic focusing of uh, a water stream with cells inside by oil uh, side streams. And then uh, you have these uh, really nice droplets uh, flowing inside this channel. Each of these droplets uh, acts like its own microreactor. So you can pack reagents into them and not just the cells. And then you can study the reactions happening in these droplets individually. Uh, so what I need to emphasize, fluid is discretized uh, into separate phases. Droplets are formed by hydrodynamic focusing. And discrete droplets are flowing in a continuous carrier phase. Typically, we talk about liquids uh, in liquids, but uh, this can also be a plug flow of liquids in gas but we will not talk about that in this lecture. Uh, making an emulsion is really simple. You just have to take water and oil and just shake it together. So that uh, is also a possibility to form droplets. And uh, applications are uh, nanoparticle synthesis, single cell analysis, and immobilization of uh, biological entities. Optofluidics is a combination of uh, light and liquids. Uh, and this might mean uh, different things. Um, it can uh, mean uh, devices where uh, the liquid acts like a waveguide to, uh, to the light, which is typically a laser. Uh, deformable lenses can also be uh, uh, qualified as optofluidic devices where the lens is uh, is a, a thin layer of, uh, of a fluid or liquid, which uh, you can modify. Um, and then that will uh, act on the optical properties of the light passing through. So uh, typically this would mean that uh, you can um, electrically affect the curvature of this uh, liquid drop and uh, that can act like a lens. Um, you can have... Uh, uh, optical biosensors, uh, optical switches, or molecular imaging tools, which uh, qualify as, as optofluidics. Um, it is an emerging field, 
but uh, not really the focus of this course. It's just some things uh, that you can uh, find information about and just something to mention. Uh, Acoustofluidics, another modality. So you can see we are going through the electromagnetic spectrum and uh, we are going through uh, different types of waves. Uh, this is the integration of uh, sound waves with fluidics, uh, typically ultrasonics. And uh, what that would mean is that uh, we have an ultrasonic transducer which uh, creates uh, these uh, acoustic waves and uh, that couples into a fluid and uh, vibrates the, the contents for the purpose that you want to realize, such as uh, actuating the liquid or uh, uh, non-contact particle or cell manipulation. And um, advantage is that uh, these are quite simple to make. Disadvantage is they are not so simple to make to work. But uh, for instance, you can use uh, this acoustic setup with an ultrasound transducer to separate different types of cells. So it is uh, something that you can use for cell sorting, kind of like how it's done in the industry with uh, um, on conveyor belts when uh, you use air to push different uh, uh, samples or different uh, uh, parts or whatever you produce uh, off the line to select them out or to uh, remove faulty um, products from your production line. But in this case, uh, if we would like to contain or collect uh, a certain type of cell, for instance from whole blood, which contains a lot of different uh, uh, cells, then uh, you can use uh, such an acoustic uh, system to, uh, to select them uh, and to remove them from the mainstream. Uh, electrophoresis. This is a technique used in uh, clinical and research laboratories to separate molecules based on their uh, size and electrical charge. And uh, it rests on the movement of uh, ions in an electric field. So you have between two electrodes an electrostatic force acting on uh, charged particles and um, uh, negative and positive particles attract to different electrodes. Uh, for positively charged ions it's called cataphoresis, for negatively charged ions it's called anaphoresis. The method is used for uh, DNA analysis where you typically have uh, a gel, it's also called gel electrophoresis. You have a gel and then you have a ladder and compared to that ladder by the different molecular weights you can quantify the length of sequences inside uh, your amplified or, or DNA sequence that you want to quantify. And uh, these are also uh, uh, all fluorescently marked, so you can visualize them. And then you will know how long, how many base pairs you have in this sequence compared to your letter. So that's what you can typically use this for. Um, future perspectives. And I have to emphasize here again that uh, this hasn't really changed. Uh, maybe Internet of Things is uh, something that, uh, that is new, but otherwise uh, this future perspective hasn't really changed in the last uh, decade. So one promise is decentralized diagnostics that uh, you will not have to send your sample to, uh, to a central laboratory to get it processed, but uh, you can do it in, uh, in a countryside clinic um, and get your uh, results faster. You can also think about decentralized diagnostics as uh, having more rapid diagnostic tools at home, so you can perform uh, more of, uh, of these uh, tests, like let's say COVID-19 recently. Uh, we have the first FDA emergency use approved um, COVID-19 point of care test, um, which uh, you can use at home then continuous monitoring and home diagnostics. Continuous monitoring especially uh, would be an important step forward in preventative healthcare or preventative medicine. Integration with medical Internet of Things is an opportunity. Shorter time from test to result. 
and access to state-of-the-art diagnostics in developing countries, as well as advanced ones. In advanced ones, this is the thing that uh, you gain, and uh, in the developing world, you can use better tools by means of uh, lab on a chip. So, in this video, I talked about uh, lab on a chip and microfluidics in general, the relevance to the modern industry, uh, different application areas, the different branches of microfluidics and uh, their applications, comparison to traditional instrumentation, limitations and future perspective.